Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, like, uh, like we've been the last uh, six or seven weeks. We're calling this How to Be Happy. Seem like it makes sense. <clears throat> Eight things that Jesus tells us about being blessed or happy. Same word. means the same thing. Now, you heard some good gospel singing this morning. That ought to make you happy. Yes. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, but Jesus is going to tell you uh, some information that you need to know if you want to live a happy life. Now, I'm just going to warn you, uh, I know I'm normally very suave and politically correct, but today probably won't be. I'm not, uh, not looking to run for any offices. Uh, I, I see the, uh, the Scripture the way I see it, and I just can't help the way I see it. Uh, there's some things that this... This beatitude um, opens the door that we really can't ignore. We have to make mention of today, and we will. Uh, but before we do that, let's, uh, let's start back from the beginning of this, this famous sermon. Uh, it's famous uh, being that I, I can't think of any other message that was ever preached uh, that has been referenced and re-preached more than this one and by the greatest preacher that ever lived. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we, we have a little confusion between Matthew and Luke as to exactly uh, the exact spot or location where he's standing when he preaches it, but we don't have any confusion about what he means when he says what he says. I, I like a, let me tell you something, uh, I like a preacher that I can understand. I, I like, even if I don't agree with him, I like to know what he meant when he gets done speaking. I like to know what he said and not be scratching my head and saying, I wonder what that message was about. When Jesus preached, you were pretty clear on how he felt about the subject. Uh, and so in verse 1, and seeing the multitudes, uh, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Remember, these build one upon another. These are concepts in your life that you... Uh, that you increase as you go. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the man or woman that realizes that he's spiritually bankrupt. Then uh, in verse 4 we see, Blessed are they that mourn. When you realize that you're spiritually bankrupt, you ought to uh, mourn over that. That ought to bring you great, great grief and sorrow, the, the godly sorrow that works repentance. He says, For they shall be comforted. And then blessed are the meek. When you realize how spiritually broke you are and you mourn over it, it humbles you and brings you into a condition where God can change and move upon your heart. For they shall inherit the earth. Then we see in verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the mer merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And today, verse 9, I've been looking forward to this one. It is this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now, I don't know about you today, but uh, I want to be called a child of God. I want to be known as a child of God. I don't want it to seem strange to others when I claim to be a Christian. I don't want them to say, oh, I'm surprised to hear that. I want them to say, I could tell by the way that you lived. I could tell by your conduct that you were a Christian. And so one of the chief marks of a true Christian, one of the identifying factors that you are a child of God that makes people look at you and say, I could tell that you were one of His, is that your life is characterized by an effort to bring peace in everything that you do. Let's pray together real quick. Father, we love you and thank you for what you've done in our lives. God, I, I come to you today asking humbly for your anointing and your power. Lord, you know me better than I know myself. God, you know me better than my family knows me. You know who and what I am. You know the struggles that I brought with me into this desk. And Father, you know the desire that I have to be endued with your power. I pray today that you would do a thing that only can be done by your word and through your spirit. Father, I pray today that we would leave closer to Jesus and more like him. If anyone here is unsaved or anyone is listening today that's unsaved, I pray that your spirit would convict them of their sin, draw them to the Savior, and bring glory to yourself. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Blessed are the, pe the, the peacemakers. This word we have translated today 
uh, as peacemakers only occurs in the New Testament one time. Uh, it's the only place you will find this particular word. Uh, so when I find something just once, I want to pay real close attention and make sure I understand all there is to understand about it because I just have one shot. It's only in here in one place. And so Jesus said that you can be happy if you're a peacemaker. Now, I know people that do not like peace. I have went to church where people did not like peace. I have been in churches before. I know this is going to surprise you and blow you away, but I have been in churches before that if there is not a problem, somebody will fabricate one. I know people that they're not happy unless they're unhappy. I know people that they can't stand peace and harmonious love and joy amongst the brethren or in their family. I know people that they wonder why they can't hold a relationship together and they've been married five times and what they don't know is they're the common denominator and they're the reason why there's no peace nowhere they go. I mean people that just don't love peace. People that will run from peace and do all they can to cause turmoil and some people that even think they're doing a, a service to God by doing that. But Jesus said, it's a happy thing to be a peacemaker. Uh, before I could adequately tell you about a peacemaker, I have to tell you what a peacemaker is not. Because everything that we look at today is presented through a different lens. Uh, I mean, everything that we see in Scripture even is painted a certain way by a certain group or groups. And I think that there's a great ministry in setting straight what the Bible does not say. And Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. That means just what it says, that as long as it is possible for you to bring peace and to pursue peace, that's exactly the very thing that you should do. That there's never a time that it's right to avoid peace when peace is possible and that you can have peace without compromising truth or without committing sin. Any time that you can bring peace and please God at the same time, that there's nothing else right to do but to do that. Let me tell you what a peacemaker is not. Well, at first, let, let me give you just a, a brief definition of the word, the word peacemaker. A, a person that is a peacemaker is pacific. That don't mean they live in California uh, on the Pacific Ocean. That means that they seek to pacify if they can. You think of the word pacifist. I'll come back to that. A peacemaker is pacific. They, they want to pacify. And now you think of a baby crying for a passy, and it's kind of silly, but sometimes that's what you have to do. Some people just have to have... I wish I had a big bag of pacifiers up here. I should have brought some. Some people just whine and cry until you stick a passy in their mouth. If all I have to do is stick a passy in your mouth and make you happy, God bless you, here's a passy. Sometimes the best thing I can do is put a passy in my kid's mouth because uh, he or she may just shut up if I do. It does not inconvenience me. It, I don't have to commit any sin to do that. It don't take a lot of time. It makes them happy. It makes me happy. If I can pacify somebody, praise God, I'll do it if I can. A peacemaker is a pacific person and a peace-loving person. A peace-loving person. But you know what a peacemaker is not? A peacemaker is not someone who is a total pacifist. You know what pacifism is, don't you? It is those people that don't believe in conflict under any circumstances. There's some good, godly, religious people that are pacifists. Some of my best friends that I've ever met are Mennonites. And I love them, and they're godly people, and they're good craftsmen, and they work hard, and, they, and, and they're, I, I admire so many things. But one of the things I cannot agree with my Mennonite friends about is that most of them are pacifists. They won't serve this country because they might have to take someone's life, and they don't believe that under any circumstances that would be the right thing to do. I'll come back to that. A peacemaker is not a total pacifist, as I understand the Scripture, and I don't make fun of those that believe that way. But I don't believe Jesus said that. It's not a total pacifist. Listen, to be a peacemaker is not to take the attitude of peace at any price. I'll tell you something. There are things worse than conflict. There are. There are things 
that might come up that prevent you and I from having peace one with another. There's a lot of hills that I won't die on. But when I, when I was a younger, younger pastor, I'd just about get my feathers ruffled about anything. And I thought you just had to take a stand and just... I mean, I didn't fight people all the time, but I had, I had a chip on my shoulder and, and I had an abrasive attitude. I offended people that I didn't need to offend. I criticized things in my message that I did not need to criticize. I had a very aggressive spirit. You know what? You've done something now if, if, uh, if you get me to fight you in a church situation. There are some hills, though, that I will die on. You had better have some boundaries. You had better have some non-negotiables. But I'm going to tell you, just everything is not one of those. I hate to use the worn out cliche, the worn out example, but I don't care what color you want the carpet to be in this place. Praise God if we grow and had to tear this thing down or add on to it or build another building. I don't care if you want it to be electric yellow. I don't care. Please don't do that. Uh, but if you do, I won't fight you over that. But you know what? There's some things that, that, that we cannot retreat from. It's not peace at any price. See, there are times that peace is not possible. We understand that because the Apostle Paul told us in the book of Romans that we should have peace as much as it lies within us. That means that there are times that it does not lie within us and that it is not always possible. To be a peacemaker is to be a peace lover, but it's not a person that would rather have peace than righteousness. It's not a person that would rather have peace than to stand for those that they love. Jesus, listen, Jesus was neither a pacifist or a revolutionary. Did you hear what I said? Jesus was not a pacifist. He was not anti-weapon. Oh, there you go getting into politics. I can't help it that, that politics encroaches on common sense. Okay, I do have nothing to do with that. But you know something? Uh, Jesus was not anti-weapon. He was not anti-violence in the strictest uh, use of the term. He was not anti-war in the strictest use of the term, but he was not a revolutionary. What did he tell to Peter when Peter pulled his sword at a time that it needed to stay in the sheath? He said, put your sword away. Has the Father sent me to this time to drink this cup and I'm not drinking? He said, those that live by the sword will die by the sword. He's not a revolutionary. But the Roman Empire thought he had come to throw them down. He was not no more interested in them than anything he was no more interested in throwing the Roman Empire down at that time than I am of going to Washington DC and taking an office let me tell, tell you how interested I am in that Jesus Christ was not a revolutionary he discouraged those that wanted to be revolutionaries those that thought that he had come to bring war and tear down uh, the Romans and, and, and take control he discouraged them and told them that that is not the reason that he had come. <coughs> but you know what else he said? Jesus also said in Luke 22, let me read you a few verses of Scripture from Luke 22. I'm going to try to have you out of here in just a few minutes. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, like ye anything? And they said nothing. So he said, There was a time I sent you out to do ministry, and you took nothing with you, and I made sure that you were provided for. You didn't have to defend yourself. You didn't have to have any money. I made sure that everything was laid in order. Right? Then he said unto them, but now. You have to understand, God does not work the same way in every situation with everybody in all periods of time. There are different dispensations, and there, there are different eras, and there are times that God says, I'll do a new thing. Listen, Jesus said, but now, he that hath a purse, let him take it. Likewise, his scrip. Listen, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Now, I don't mean to stretch the words of Christ, and I know it sounds a little funny, but it sounds to me like he'd rather you be naked as for you to be defenseless. He, 
he don't want you to go on your journey uh, to, to do your ministry and go foolishly defenseless and some vagabond come along and, and try to take your money and beat you and leave you for dead. He wants you to have a defense. He's not anti-weapon, but he's not a revolutionary. Listen to this. For I say unto you that, that this must be written, or that this, this is written, let me try again. I can't hardly read. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. In other words, I'm not going to be here bodily in the way that I am now to provide for you in the way that I'm providing for you now. I'm going to provide for you in different ways. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. He didn't say go get an arsenal and everybody be ready to chop heads. You got two swords, you have a defense, it is enough. You can do what you need to do with that. So Jesus was not anti-weapon. So by saying peacemakers, he didn't say take your guns down, uh, down to the town square and pile them up and give them to the government and trust them to protect you. You got rooms to rent upstairs unfurnished if you do that. He said, have a sword. Have a defense. He's not anti-weapon. Let me tell you something else about Jesus. He does not bring peace in every relationship. The whole point of this is to pursue peace, like I said on Sunday night. The, uh, Psalm 34 said, seek peace and pursue it. Chase after it violently. Take hold on peace anytime you can have it. But if you have to sin or neglect the defense of those that you love in order to do it, God does not ask you to do it. If you have to compromise the Word of God, or if you have to compromise any truth for that matter in order to have peace, God does not command you to do it. Right. <coughs> you have to understand there are people that don't want peace with you. Right. There are people that you cannot pacify. You don't have a big enough pacifier. Yeah, I mean, they don't want, it's, it's not that they want something from you. They cannot be appeased. It's getting quiet. I better start giving you scripture for what I'm saying. He does not bring peace in every relationship. He said in Matthew 10, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. In other words, a general widespread a domineering peace that covers the whole globe. I am come not to send peace, but a sword. You know what swords do? They cut and divide. There's never been a more divisive man that's ever lived than Jesus Christ. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. In other words, when I come into your life, I'm divisive, and there's some people that will not join themselves to you. He knew that. He warned us of that. Why do you think he said, he that comes to me must hate father and mother? And, and, and all. He, he didn't mean that you should loathe them, but that you should love him in such a way that you would choose him over them. Because sometimes it's necessary. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, he says. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. You know what crosses are for? They're dying on. They're for dying on. That's why you have them. They're an emblem of suffering and shame, as the song says. But there's some things worth dying for. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Jesus is not anti-weapon. He does not bring peace in every relationship. It gets even more interesting. Jesus used violence. He did. He did not look for opportunities to use violence, but if it became necessary, he was not above it. I told you this not, not too long ago, but, but in John chapter 2, verse 15, it said that when he had made a scourge of small cords, he made it with his hands. It was a premeditated action. He had to take the time to fashion that weapon that he, it does not say that he hit anybody with it. I doubt he had to. I bet you when you saw the, the, the incarnation of God walking through the temple with a purpose and a weapon in his hand, I bet you cleared out. But he was prepared to use it if he needed to. Because there was something, he wouldn't fight you over a lot of things, but he would fight you over the zeal of his father's house. 
He was a fulfillment of the prophecy that said, I am eaten up with the zeal of my father's house. The fact that his father's worship was being desecrated was something that was worth fighting over to the Son of God. He used violence. You know what else he does? He threatens violence. He does. He wants you to be a peacemaker, but you've got to understand what a peacemaker is. Well, I didn't think it would be this quiet. I thought we was in East Tennessee here. Uh, I mean, <laughs> he said... In Revelation 2 and 16, he, he's, he's talking to John on the Isle of Patmos, and he's delivering a message to some of the churches. And you know what he did? He threatened violence. He said, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. I'm going to tell you something that will shock you. I'm noticing something right now. I've talked about it for 10 years, and now that it's happening, it scares me. I've, for 10 years of... Uh, over 10 years of preaching, I have said that there's some churches that would be better off closed than to stay open the way they are. Because they decided a long time ago that they did not want to exist for the purpose of the glory of God. And now you know what they're doing? Some of them are shutting the doors. I'm hearing it increasingly more churches that I know. Churches I've preached to, they're shutting the doors. I don't mean to imply, and if any of them happen to be watching us today, I don't mean to imply that this is the case for everyone. I'm just making a general statement. But do you know what's the number one threat against the average church in America today? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the greatest threat to the average church in the United States of America. Because he said, you have left your first love, and unless you repent and do the first works, I will take your candlestick away. You don't have to worry about some outsider coming in and tearing up the church. The church is too strong for that. You don't have to worry about the devil coming and tearing the church down, but you do have to worry about the one that holds the deed, tearing it down if he sees fit. Jesus said, if churches don't repent, I will take them away. <coughs> Oh, for years I've heard the complaint that we've got all these churches that need pastors and pastors that don't, and preachers that don't want a pastor. You've got some churches that don't want a pastor. And instead of getting more preachers, we're getting fewer churches. But Jesus, the whole point of what, I almost caught that rabbit, but the whole point of what I'm saying is that Jesus threatened violence. That's pretty strong language, the sword that comes out of my mouth. So not only did he use violence, not only does he threaten violence, but when he comes again, he'll use violence again. In Revelation chapter 19, we read of a day that he's going to come back uh, and that he's going to put all of his enemies under his feet. He's going to take rule of this world, that one world government that will have been uh, assembled at that time under the rule and reign of Antichrist and his false prophet. Uh, Jesus will come to tear that kingdom down. He's going to do what they thought he would do the first time and more. The Bible says that, that the sword that proceeds out of his mouth will destroy his enemies. I think that probably refers to simply the words drop dead. That's all he has to say and his enemies fall before him. Do you remember the time in the book of John? They came to arrest him and they came to put him under authority. Uh, uh, and they came to apprehend him and they say, he said, who seek ye? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. All he said was, I am. Your King James Bible, when you see a little squiggly italicized word, it means it was added for ease of reading by the translators. You see, I am he, and he is in italics. That means somebody added that. You know what Jesus said? I am. He was saying the same thing that he said to Abraham. Uh, the same thing that he said to Moses. He was saying the same thing when he identified himself in the Old Testament. You say that was God the Father and this is the Son. Did you forget that Jesus said, He that has seen the Father has seen me, and he that has seen me has seen the Father. All he had to say is, I am. And those words came out of his mouth like a two-edged sword, and 600 men fell to the ground. I bet that was an awkward scene, was it? 600 men with lanterns and weapons, they come to arrest Jesus, and all he does is speak a word, and they all fall down. <laughs> and they all fall down. Hey, they, they, all, they all get back up, and, and he says, I asked you, who are you looking for? And they're, they're brushing themselves off, looking around. Uh, uh, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> and he said, I'll come with you. Hey, he used violence he threatened violence when he comes again he'll use violence again 
All of his enemies will fall just at the word that proceeds out of his mouth. So is, is Jesus speaking of uh, pacifism and, and uh, no military and no defense and no weapons and, and never any violence under any circumstance? No, he is speaking of an effort to make peace and keep peace. <coughs> so sometimes you have to fight to keep the peace. Sometimes you have to fight to make the peace. Barry Howard, thank you for being a peacemaker for this nation. Thank you for being able and willing to fight to make the peace and being willing to fight to keep it. You know, I'm going to tell you something. I'm sick to death of this anti-law enforcement, anti-military agenda. You get mad, say it's political if you want to. I already told you I can't help it that politics encroaches on common sense. I am thankful that there's some people that are willing to be a peacemaker for me. I'm thankful there's some people that are willing to take a bullet for me. I'm thankful that I live in a nation where I'm allowed to stand here and say and do what I'm saying today because of the peacemakers that have shed countless gallons of blood for me and for the sake of this gospel. I'm thankful for those right now that are patrolling up and down these roads I know there's a handful of bad apples, but I'm not going to throw them all away because of that. Amen. I'm thankful for those that are willing to make the peace and keep the peace. Amen. You say, well, that's not a very Christ-like attitude. You say, well, that's, that's not a very uh, biblical attitude. That's not a good Christian. Let me tell you something else the Word of God says. The Bible says, I think it was Peter that said it. I forgot to put it in my notes. So I don't remember. Uh, but uh, it's either Paul or Peter. And he said this, if any man... Provide not for them of his own, uh, for his own, especially them of his own house. He hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Worse than an unbeliever. Let me give you a little scenario. Let's just say I'm at home uh, with my family. Let me tell you something about my home. That's the farthest place I can retreat. If you want to bring harm to me, I can run away from you, but I can't go any farther than my house. Let's say I'm in my house. And, and, and that woman back there that I love and those three kids that I love, they're in my house. Let's say it's the middle of the night and somebody breaks into my house. I can assume two or three things about him. <laughs> I can assume he didn't come over for coffee or Bible study. I can assume by his own admission and on the authority of the Word of God that he is a thief and that he has come but to steal and to kill and to destroy. At that point, he and I have one thing in common. We are both willing to risk his life. We are both willing for him not to see the sun come up tomorrow morning. I'm not chasing after trouble. I'm not looking for trouble. I want to be a peacemaker. I would hate it if I hurt somebody. But you know something? The peace of my family and the provision of their protection is more important to me than the thief that breaks in to steal and kill and destroy. He can assume one thing as well. He can assume that if he lives to see the sun tomorrow and he takes a drink of water, he'll look like a sprinkler. And you say, would Jesus say that? He told me to get a sword 2,000 years ago if he was here today. I think he might say get a firearm. Because there's not a lot of people breaking into houses toting swords today. Don't bring a sword to a gunfight. Hey. If somebody came into this house of worship here, it would be a very foolish thing. But if he did, he'd look like Swiss cheese when they told him out. I know that's the case. Well, I didn't think it'd be this quiet. Now, how am I a peacemaker if I retreat from conflict knowing that it will bring harm and death and destruction to those that I love that I'm charged with the protection and the provision of. See, I'm sick to death of people taking the Scripture and twisting it to say things that it did not say. What's a peacemaker? It's a peace lover. I love peace. I love it when there's no conflict. I love it when I lock the doors at night just because I think I should and not because somebody tried to break in last night. I love it to come to church and have harmony and peace and, and for everybody to love each other. But you know something? If somebody comes to try to harm that or to tear that down, if I have to resort to some kind of conflict to stop it, I will. Amen. 
on, on a less physical note, just think of peace in the church. I'm telling you, I know what it I know I'm a young man, I understand that. But I've been in this thing long enough that I know what it is to drive to church and my ulcer's bleeding all the way because I hate to face the people that I'm going to preach to. Not that I hate them. God bless them, wonderful people. And, and, and three churches, God has blessed me to pastor and people that I love. But there have been those that were opponents and enemies of peace. And I don't know what it is about me. God's blessed me. That he, maybe he just won't let me leave and finally they do. I don't know what it is. But you know something? I'm, I'm willing to fight you if I have to to keep peace. I don't mean a gunfight or a fist fight. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that it's not peace at any price. Sometimes it takes conflict to have peace. Look at the nation you live in. It took conflict to have what we have. I've heard a few stories. You've had times of unrest in this church and somebody somewhere had to stand up against something or somebody to maintain the peace you have today. I need to sit down and say amen myself. Jesus is not a revolutionary, but he's not a pacifist. He wants me to have peace and pursue it. And thank God that are willing even to fight if necessary to have it. And let me, let me, this is one of those things where the introduction is long and the message is real short. You know who the, the supreme peacemaker is? The one that spoke the words. Jesus Christ is my supreme peacemaker. Even though he resorted to violence. And even though he's coming in a very violent manner when he comes again. And even though uh, he understands that I may uh, need to have a defense at times. And even though he's not a total pacifist. He has a love for peace. And even though he said I come not to bring peace on earth. He did come to bring peace in my heart. And he did come to bring peace among the body. See this is not peace on earth this is peace in the body peace on earth will never come until jesus does i'm already in trouble i'll go a little farther let me tell you something there's not going to be peace on earth as long as there are radical islamic terrorists i don't care about your political persuasion but i'm going to tell you something you're going to fight them somewhere on this earth as long as they exist and you exist it's going to happen Thank God for those that are willing to fight them somewhere else so I don't have to fight them here. Amen. You know who the supreme peacemaker is, though? The Lord Jesus Christ. Because he understood and he understands that fights may break out and wars may occur and it may bring peace for a little while, but it does not bring lasting peace. It does not bring eternal peace. He came to bring eternal peace. I cannot wait until he comes and brings peace on the earth, but I have that peace now. He, he came to bring peace a few different ways. Let me tell you the first thing he did. If you're unsaved, I want you listening close for just a moment. Jesus Christ came to do this. He came to bring peace with God. I chose that word very specifically, very purposely. Jesus came to bring peace with God. Romans 5 and 1, listen. I don't know if you realize as an unsaved person that you're an enemy of God. The, the biggest conflict in your life is the conflict conflict against God he said in Romans 5 and 1 therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ Amen. I'm going to tell you there's not any other way to have peace with God just to say just to, just to make his name the name of Jesus synonymous with something else or, or just to use the Father and the Son interchangeably that actually weakens the reason why Jesus came. There is a Father, but there is a Son. And He's a specific Son. He's a specific individual and unique person. He came specifically to bridge a gap between God and man. I cannot have peace on earth. I cannot have peace in the church. I cannot have peace with others, I can't have peace in myself until I have peace with God. <coughs> Listen, it does not matter who your friends are if God is your enemy. We love to say this, and it's from the Word of God, that if God be for us, who can be against us? But you could flip that too. If God be against us, who could be for us? 
If you're an unsaved person, God is against you. It does not mean that He hates you or that He does not love you or that He does not desire to save you. He does all of those things. But until you receive His Son, you are an enemy of God. The same chapter, verse 10, tells us this. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Not just by His death, but by His resurrection, His perpetual, everlasting, ongoing, eternal life. Listen, we have to have peace with God. Blessed are the peacemakers, the ones that make their peace with God. I don't mean on your deathbed. Well, I, let, I, I read a whole list of quotations. You know what? I'm going to try to find them. I had not even thought about this. I, I read some famous last words of atheists the other day. Listen to this. Making your peace with God does not mean waiting till your fleeting breath and then admitting you were wrong all this time and then pass off into eternity. Most of the time it means a lot more than that. You ever heard of Thomas Paine? Listen. The leading atheistic writer in the American colonies. We're talking colonial days. We're talking about the times of the forefathers. We're talking about at times that Christianity was the, almost the rule of law. Listen to his dying words. Stay with me. For God's sake, I cannot bear to be left alone. Oh, Lord, help me. Oh, God, what have I done to suffer so much? What will become of me hereafter? I would give words if I had them that the age of reason had never been published. That was his atheistic literary work. He said, Oh, Lord, help me. Christ, help me. No, don't leave. Stay with me. Send even a child to stay with me, for I am on the edge of hell here alone. If ever the devil had an agent, I have been that one. Wow. That man that boldly and for a lifetime and with much eloquence and education denied the existence of this God became very much convinced of his reality in his dying moments. Blessed or happy are those that make their peace with God. Those that, that, that give their life to him instead of facing him in death. Got to hurry. He brings us peace with God, but then once he's done that, here's where a lot of Christians, maybe some here, have never got to after he gives you the peace with God. He can give you the peace of God. The peace of God means that it belongs to him and it comes from him. Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not as the world giveth, I give I unto you. That the world cannot take away. They can't, ta listen, they can't take what they didn't give. And by the way, take this for what it's worth. Everything they give you, they can take back. But he gives us the peace of God, the, the peace that belongs to God. Uh, that, that peace does two or three things. First thing it does, it keeps us. It keeps us. It guards us. It, it holds us where we should be. Philippians 4 and 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. That, that means I cannot, sometimes I have peace. When I can't explain to you how I could have peace. Those situations you were talking about, you're in the hospital and someone's passing from this life to the next. And it's a terrible thing. But the peace of God comes into the room and it's just okay, but you can't explain why. Those, those days that you're in those depths of depression and anxiety and, and despair and, and, and it's like there's a dark cloud and you're having even spiritual warfare but there's a closeness with God that comes in that time that you don't have any other time. That's a peace of God that passes all understanding. It shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It keeps us, but listen, it also rules us and it brings unity in the church. Colossians 3 and 15. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Last thing I want to tell you he does. Is he gives us not just a peace with God. And a peace of God. But he gives us peace in turmoil. Not peace from turmoil. The only reason that I don't preach that 
that message that turmoil ends when you come to Christ. The only reason I don't preach that is because the Bible does not say it. But what I have found is that in the pages of the Word of God and in my own life, I can tell you the times. He didn't insulate me from turmoil. Wish He would sometimes. He gives me peace in turmoil. There's not, I don't always live in that. I cannot lie. Here lately, I've struggled with it a whole lot. But you know what? It's available. Peace in turmoil. Depart from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. I'll close with this verse. I'm not going to have a song of invitation. I'm going to close a little bit differently today. But Jesus said in this same Sermon on the Mount, in verse 44 of chapter 5, Matthew, he said, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Right, if you're looking for what does he mean by be a peacemaker, you make your peace with God, you receive the peace of God, and then you can be a disseminator of that peace. There are people, I told you there's, and, and I probably labored the point too hard, I told you there's people that don't want peace. I told you there's people that you cannot have peace with. I told you there's there's people that you even have to be violent with. It's just a, it's just a reality. You don't hear a whole lot of sermons about that. <laughs> it's just a reality, though. I said all that, so don't let me neglect to say this. A majority of people, a whole lot of people, they may be aggressive. They may hate you for your faith. They may be miserable and want others to be miserable too. But a majority of people can still be touched by this principle that a soft word turneth away wrath. A lot of people will drop their guard when they meet a peace lover that wants to have peace with them. A whole lot of people that otherwise might be ready to fight, maybe they don't know it, but they just need a friend. They're called enemies for a reason. Some of them persecute you in such a way that, that you cannot have peace with them. But others, others, let me close by saying this, others are just too small of a person to be the peacemaker. Sometimes you just have to be the bigger person. If there's going to be any peace, you'll be the one to make it. I hope you have peace with God. hope you have the peace of God. I, I hope you have peace, inner peace, within yourself. If you don't, you won't ever have peace with other people. <coughs> I want to close in a, in a different way. I want you to, those that can and, and want to, I want you to join me up here in this altar. I want us to close in a word of prayer for our peacemakers. Uh, I'd hate to be charged with keeping the peace in this society where they tell them look at our law enforcement look at our military where, where the, the, the disagreements that people have with, with the, the choices of politicians affect the honor and respect that they have for our service members in, in a time where they're telling our law enforcement when they're going into the inner city to deal with someone who's hopped up on a deadly cocktail of, of illicit drugs and alcohol and already laid two or three out in the road dead, they say, just take a psychologist with you. It'll be all right. I hate to be in those situations today. And I thank God for those that are. And I thank God for some of you that are peacemakers in your home and peacemakers in your place of work. Could we join together and ask God to help us be peacemakers and ask him to bless those that are.